The Real Cost of Prisons Project is a Northampton-based organization that focuses on ending what its supporters call extreme sentencing, such as life in prison without the possibility of parole. A proposed change to that law in Massachusetts could mean a parole hearing after 25 years. I asked Lois Ahrens, the founding director of the Real Cost of Prisons Project, why she supports that concept. I support it because I believe people can change. And people who were convicted of often one horrible crime, um, maybe when they were 19 or 20 or even in their early 20s, end up spending their, can end up spending their lifetime, their entire lifetime incarcerated till they die in prison. And I've known people that have died in prison and it's horrible for them and it's horrible for the people that love them. And so, and I mean, it's also unbelievably costly because some prisons like in Massachusetts have turned into basically hospice care because, I mean, I visited people where you see prisoners, you know, on oxygen tanks and wheelchairs. And I mean, to me, they're not posing any threat to public safety. I mean, they can't leave a, a bed and yet they're incarcerated. So... I believe that we ought to give people the possibility. I'm not saying that every single person who has a sentence of life without the possibility of parole should be paroled. But I believe that people should be able to show over a period of years that they're changed and they should be able to leave prison. There's a huge increase in the number of people who are serving the sentence in Massachusetts. One in nine people in state prison have that sentence. Let me jump in here. This has obviously been a hotly debated issue. Yes. There was a state house hearing um, in October about yes. this, and some of the family members of people who have been killed spoke out, one of whom was Terry Tidcum from Charleston. Her son was murdered 25 years ago, and she said, quote, what does my son get? What do we get as victims? I don't get to kiss my son. I go to the cemetery. I look at his stone. My son doesn't know I'm there. What about her criticism? That What do victims get? I think that, I mean, this is a really complicated issue, um, as you know. Um, I think what's happened over time in the United States, not in other Western countries and other countries that don't even have this sentence, don't have this sentence of life without the possibility of parole, that victims, because of uh, prosecutors, because of victim rights organizations, have come to believe over time that, that the only, their only justice is somebody uh, serving their life in prison. And I, I think that over time, there are people, many people, there was just a, a show um, about a woman named Janet Connors that was on WGBY last night um, about how she, her son was horribly killed and she was able over time to reconcile with the people, the, the three men that killed him. And there is that, there is that movement going on around the country where victims don't only have the position that the only, the only justice that they can get is from, um, is, is somebody either being killed, we don't have the death penalty here, an eye for an eye. This is like the, the 21st century equivalent of it. And I think over time when we're raising this issue, that it allows people to come forward who don't who have had a loved one killed and who don't want to see that another person suffer in the same suffer or another family suffer in the same way that they're suffering by having their loved one locked up for their entire lifetime so what do you think is a reasonable sentence i think i think a reasonable sentence is 25 years and then the possibility of parole. In Massachusetts right now, people with the possibility of parole, of which there is another thousand, go before the parole board many, many, many times and never get paroled, not because of that their crime was that much more egregious, 
but because of a parole board that's set up basically right now um, to not parole people who are second degree lifers. So I think just the possibility of parole doesn't necessarily mean, especially in the system that we have now, that it, it's going that people are going to be paroled. Many people who supported the concept of the change to the the system to allow some parole as an opportunity for people who are imprisoned also supported criminal justice reform, which was passed last year in Massachusetts. It got a lot of support in the legislature. It was sort of heralded as a, as a win. What's your perspective? Were you pleased with the legislation? I believe it was a first step. Um, I mean, they the way that it was heralded was that it was um, legislation um, in our lifetime, uh, significant in our lifetime. And in a way, it's true because almost nothing has happened in our lifetime. <laughs> so, I mean, so there, so it was compared to nothing basically having happened for decades, just more more bills and more legislation that extends sentences, you know, make sentences longer, make criminalize more people. This was an attempt to begin to turn some of that legislation that started in the 70s and up until now has, gone, has just been more and more and more uh, things considered crimes, sentences much longer. I mean, in- Mandatory minimums coming mandatory in. Mandatory minimums and, and so it was a way to sort of look back, look and say, okay, we need to start making some changes. But, the, but what people are finding out, many of us are finding out, is that a lot of those things that were passed in the Criminal Justice Reform Act aren't being implemented. Can you give one specific yes, example? solitary. There, there were some small changes that were made to solitary in Massachusetts. There are hundreds and hundreds of people in solitary in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is the only state that actually sentences in the country, sentences somebody to solitary for 10 years. Hmm. So it's a, Massachusetts is an outlier in terms of the, the intensity of the kind of solitary that people are put in. And so there were these small changes that were asked the DOC, Department of Corrections, to make. And yet it turned out that the DOC has done everything to stonewall those changes. So right now, I mean, I think it just happened last week, uh, Senator Jamie Eldridge just filed a bill that basically says, hey, wait a second, this bill passed, the Criminal Justice Reform Act, and We've seen over and over again that the DOC is doing everything to thwart its implementation. And here's a bill to try to basically ask, ensure that the DOC actually um, follows, follows the bill, were... follows what's not even, it's not a bill, it follows the law. I want to ask you a few questions about your organization, the Real Cost of Prisons Project. It's found, it's based here in Northampton. You founded it 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Are the reasons that you founded it, do they remain this, the reasons that you have kept up the project these 20 years, or is, has it shifted? Um, it's basically, I mean, what I wanted to do when I started it was to tell people about the real costs of prisons. And jails, not just the the seventy billion dollars a year, but what the impact of incarcerating two point three million people is, and five million people on probation and parole, what that is for our communities, what that is for individuals, what that is for our for families. So there was that part, and the other piece of it was to work on decarceration to try to, I mean, in the last 40 years, an additional 2 million people are incarcerated every year. In, in, in 1970, there were 200,000 people incarcerated. Now there are 2.3 million people incarcerated. So it's a, a part of the goal is not just to tell people what's going on, but to look at alternatives to incarceration and to look at the systems that have been brought we've created in the last 40 years that have driven what we call mass incarceration.